talking about these issues, even the provocation of thinking about gender and data was really um, informative for me. And it's a question that I've been coming back to in my research for a long time. So I want to just begin first again with thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you virtually. I want to say that I'm joining you all from the traditional unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, many other tribes such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, and Fox, also called this area home. And I was really moved by a non-land acknowledgement in which indigenous elders made clear that the land acknowledgement is not enough because it can subtly help white supremacy relax. And I'm not really interested in that being relaxed, but when it comes to our turn to the digital in these pandemic times, it can be easy to forget that there is hardware that runs all over Turtle Island, uh, what we understand as North America, that connects our digital devices. And that this hardware is made from minerals extracted from stolen land, mined by exploited people around the world. So when discussing my work and its social justice implications, I don't want to forget the too often invisibilized logics of settler colonialism that can become even harder to see or acknowledge with our need to turn towards digital technology in these pandemic times. And in addition to acknowledging the traditional stewards of this land, I also work to make sure that my research supports the descendants of those whose enslaved labor made a lot of these academic places possible. So I also want to acknowledge the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants, Black Evastonians and Chicagoans, like the founder of Chicago, Jean Baptiste Point de Sable, who have enriched the region with culture and economic contributions that can never be truly quantified. And this question of quantification is really where my talk kind of takes up. How do we quantify, how do we deal with and address questions of gender and data in our work? How do we actually see some of the people who are very much impacted by the world we live in? How does our research either support or can it potentially harm those communities in our efforts to try and expose and make things more clear? So my question right now is, how are we really deciding what research areas we want to pursue? How are we making decisions about that? And is it actually useful to the communities we purport to help? So to get us started, I'm looking actually at the uh, epilogue of uh, my book, Hashtag Activism, that I wrote and co-authored with Sarah J. Jackson and Brooke Buko Wells. And one of the things we talk about in this text is at the end was that it was a real particular moment in which we were able to produce this book. Our research ethics included uh, a few guidelines about how we would handle Twitter data when we began to look at it. So although we worked with our institutional review board, to establish an ethical framework for handling Twitter data, we found ourselves leaning more heavily on our own internally negotiated and I would say higher standards for ethical data use as we drafted each chapter. Some chapters demanded more privacy protections than others as some topics and individual tweets revealed sensitive information. Although we always operated on the assumption that ordinary non-public figures who were using Twitter do not fully appreciate that their data can be used by researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, after recent confirmation and scholarly research, we added an additional ethical practice to our workflow. So in addition to the guidelines outlined in our introduction, where we you know, considered who was creating the tweet, we also wanted to make sure that we were lifting up um, voices that were traditionally marginalized and that we wanted to respect signals of privacy that people added uh, with their tweets. So we were in the fortunate position being at Northeastern to have access to an abundant amount of Twitter data. Our colleague, Ellen Mislove had actually started 
digesting all of Twitter's tweets uh, before Twitter decided that that was not a good idea for an academic to have that much information. And so we were able to get a really robust sample of, of tweets. And some of those tweets actually no longer existed on the platform when we went to cross check and see if they were still up. And so one of the things we decided is if a tweet was in our original data, but then was not was no longer visible on Twitter, that we wouldn't use it to protect uh, people's decision and their right to delete tweets and not necessarily have that information public. Uh, one of the other challenges that we had was trying to determine whether or not uh, people were understanding or changes to their gender identification. So uh, we had some tweets and definitely in my uh, research for misogynoir transformed, people transitioned, how they talked about themselves at one point on Twitter was different than perhaps the next time I was looking at it. So trying to be attentive and pay attention to those changes and really be mindful and careful about how we represented people in our data. So one thing that we did for hashtag activism is that we gave people the opportunity. Uh, we reached out to each of the handles that were obviously handles by individual Twitter users who did not have, who weren't celebrities or didn't have accounts that had an enormous number of followers. We reached out to them and said, we're researchers, we're doing this project. We'd love to include your tweet. Uh, if you would like your handle not to be used, please let us know. And that process was a bit arduous. It took some time, but we got responses and people were very kind and gracious and glad to be informed upfront that we had this interest in their information. So that was how things worked in relationship to hashtag activism. I wanna switch now to talk a bit about my book, Misogynoir Transformed, and these real questions of gender and race that came up in, in my research. So one thing I'm going to just pull up is that I really wanted to think about who were the communities that I was really trying to reach and how those communities were being understood. What were the ways that people understood themselves in relationship to um, this idea of misogynoir. So I define misogynoir as the unique way that black women are being represented negatively in popular media and culture. And one of the ways that I think about that, it's not just black women, it's people read as black women. So trying to find a way in a language to think about how do I really convey the sense that this isn't just about uh, black women who identify as such, but it's also about people who are read that way, whether or not they understand themselves that way. And this is a bit about me coming to terms with the language I would use. So I experimented with terms to describe those of us on the margins of the margins of black womanhood. Also, as I experimented with terms before landing on misogynoir, digital spaces are rife with words, phrases, and terms that attempt sometimes awkwardly to address the slippage between women and all who aren't cis men. One of these terms is non-men, which actually, in my estimation, centers men as it attempts to define those who are not men. And then non-men is used online as a catch-all term, but its use recreates the exact erasure it wants to undo. There's also women X uh, with an X, which seems a useful, uh, a useful tool with its roots in pre-colonial indigenous languages and contemporary decolonial lingual practices. The X in Women X intervenes in the racist colonial histories of English and Spanish while also attempting to solve the problem of genders beyond the man-woman binary. 
And that's a lot of work for one letter to do. However, even as Women X by definition includes gender, non-binary, agender, and gender variant people who don't identify as women, reading the term in text does not make those communities readily apparent. As S.A. Smythe asks in their article on black feminism slippages with the terms feminists and women, who all over there in Women X? When a term is created to encapsulate those outside or alongside the term black women, another erasure occurs. And there's also the phrase women and femmes, which has been pretty popular lately, which has been used in social media spaces to make space for those who are not women, but may find themselves hailed by the term femme, which also has contested meanings. But women and femmes doesn't quite capture all the targets of misogynoir. There are masculine of center, agender, and non-binary people who experience the negative effects of misogynoir and who may not identify as women or femmes. Similarly, not all non-binary black femmes experience misogynoir because they are not read as black women in public. For some femmes, homophobia and femphobia might be the lens through which they become targets of violence. Black femphobia is an important form of oppression to discuss, but it's not a synonym for misogynoir. Misogynoir is deployed because of social beliefs about black women, and those of us who are read as black women, despite our self-identification, get caught in the crosshairs. And so I am thinking a lot about how we use language to talk to and speak of the communities that we care about. In writing the book, all of my research, all of the examples that I had really spoke to black women's experiences. There wasn't work in research that had disaggregated the experiences of non-binary black people who could be interpreted as women and understood as women. Uh, it became this catch-all category. So when we think about data and gender, I really want us to start to think about how are we making space and making room for all of the people that we're actually talking about? How do we see them in the data? And then also where are the consequences of seeing them in the data? Because there are lots of reasons why this disaggregation can create and cause its own harm if people are then made apparent in this way, is there a possibility that other harms can come to them? So these are some of the things that have really animated my thinking. I'm moving forward with a new project now, trying to imagine what kind of solidarities can be built across different exploited communities within the digital supply chain. So thinking a lot about uh, child miners in the Democratic Republic of the Congo who mine the minerals that power a lot of our digital devices. Of course, a lot of those children are, are young girls. How are we thinking about the way that gender is impacting them, impacting their position in this digital supply chain, and then also how it enables some of us in the West to do lots of incredible social justice organizing on these same digital devices around the issues of gender exploitation and gender oppression. So I want us to, as we're doing our research, also think about the people, the hidden humans who are bolstering up the digital economy that creates the context for our work and integrating new strategies for addressing and making visible those stories and those narratives, even if that's not where our research lies, being clear that that's also part of what we should be attending to as we do our work. And I wanna say thank you all so much for having me and for taking the time to listen.